Uh, next speaker, uh, Steve Hatfield Dodds, Director of the Cyro Integration Science and Modeling Collaboration, also an adjunct professor here at ANU uh, and longtime collaborator. He previously worked in senior roles for Australian government, inclu including Treasury and Department uh, of Climate Change. He's a thought leader on these issues, and I think the uh, work on, uh, on forestry modeling that he's presenting now is really just a very small slice of the kind of portfolio that, that he stands for. Steve. So thanks very much, Frank, and thanks to the, the previous speakers who have all um, been worryingly good. So I know that the standard is high. And my slides are actually pretty boring, so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. I should acknowledge my collaborators, particularly Brett and Martin, who actually did the, the land use work. I'm, I'm leading a big project that we call the National Outlook, which will be out in the middle of the year, and, and this work is drawing on that capacity. So because uh, I'm in a university, I'll tell you what I'm going to say three times, so this is the first time through. Um, I'm going to talk about the model and how it's really techy and complicated, and you can trust it because it's good. Um, when we run the model, uh, we find that there's a big debate about how would land use change work in Australia under a voluntary payments sort of offset scheme. We find that, that when you pay for carbon, you get carbon, and you get almost no biodiversity, or in more technical language, no mixed species plantings. Uh, and so the biodiversity benefits are slim. If there's something that likes working, uh, living in single species monoculture, then you're fine. Um, we also find, given the assumption of the project, which is that the world is going for two degrees, uh, we find in that world uh, you get around four times much profitable carbon in Australia uh, than the project wanted. So the project was embarrassed that there was too much carbon available, and we scaled it back. I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I'll get to real implications at the end, but basically that tells you that with, with land credits in the mix, uh, Australia can achieve any target that's been discussed. Okay, so Anthea's lovely target, which I love, which will be up here, the budget, we can achieve that with spare change. Um, <clears throat> the scenarios involve big challenges and opportunities for rural communities and land use, and some technical issues around water governance and other things that I'll come back to. So I won't speak to this. It's a really, really detailed spatial model. It has 23 agricultural commodities, a number of different types of land use. It's solved at one kilometre grid. Um, it's a big area. Uh, and every time we have had an assumption, we've been conservative uh, and biased against carbon planning, in a sense. We assume high agricultural prices that they're competing with. <sighs> this is what we find. So these are big numbers on the side. You know, this is a lot of carbon being planted, and it reflects very quick action, as you'd expect, in the world going to two degrees. Uh, and the growth curve is the function of both of the, the carbon from a particular place and uptake of increasing areas over time. Um, <clears throat> what we actually assume for the modelling is these lines down here. So we've modelled all those as what would be profitable and we said, you know, uh, we'd be too embarrassed to go into the UN discussions with and say, oh, we're so negative, it's not funny. So we've just used the land sector to balance the budget effectively. We're, so that means we're taking a third to a half. So these are the shares, the top pie charts. Uh, the middle pie charts assume really slow uptake, that there's a whole bunch of reasons that even after 35 years, nobody thinks, oh, maybe we should build seed banks so we can plant things. Uh, so it's the most conservative view we could take of, and, and even then, you've got an oversupply of potential carbon. And so we run through these scenarios and you can see the different land use mixes. So the ones I'm going to focus now on are the two left ones that sort of bracket this one so it, we leave it behind. <coughs> so it implies we could get that budget. Basically, we're looking at the scenarios. Anna mentioned that there were three different energy scenarios. So we took the energy scenario with the highest emissions and the energy scenario with the lowest residual emissions and, and, we, and we, um, we offset those. Th this is what happens to land use. So Australia is a big place. If you've driven around and looked at, you know, wheat and trees and, and cows and things, there's a lot of it, okay? Um, <coughs> so what this is saying is after you've done that scaling back, you would be changing about 20% of the already cleared land in agricultural use uh, in, in Australia by 2050, and these are the uptake curves. So this is, in a sense, a carbon-focused approach. It assumes no sort of weight to biodiversity, and the, the other one is the one that gives some weight to biodiversity, so about a third of the area 
uh, is biodiversity. I'll just note that, you know, that reverses 200 years or more of history in Australia by, by increasing the area of native habitat. That has non-trivial benefits. And, and these are the maps. Can you see those? Not really. Okay. There's blue bits in there that I can see really well on the screen. Um, <coughs> essentially, there are quite large areas of northern New South Wales up into to western Queensland where you could get plantings. And then when you care about biodiversity, we'll run across the stage here. Uh, over here, there's lots of green that you can't see. Uh, a lot of the, the biodiversity plantings happen on the, on the southern edge, uh, also down here as well. But, but, so this is profitable potential rather than what we've uh, assumed is actually under plantings. Um, uh, but it's, it's twice the size of Tasmania. You know, it's quite a lot of planting. Uh, and that raises some other issues. Sorry. <coughs> so I've just run through, because I think the discussion will be more interesting than me talking. So, so what do we take out of this? What are the real insights? You know, the first is that zero carbon is achievable. It's quite plausible. Even with, you know, <coughs> thinking about how long it would take to negotiate these sorts of changes and those sorts of things. Uh, that there's nothing overly complicated. It's not like going to the moon because, you know, we already have the technology here. Uh, my smartphone is smarter than the, the moon launcher anyway. Um, <coughs> the other point is, you know, zero carbon is achievable for an energy superpower. You know, there's no structural change being driven in this. Australia remains producing the stuff it produces. It just does it with electricity that doesn't have as much carbon in it anymore. We still dig up lots of iron ore. Um, we just do it using different energy solutions. So the structure of the economy is much the same. Um, <coughs> by the time we get to 2050, we're probably all better looking than we are now. Um, <coughs> so, so another way of saying that is with land sector sequestration in the mix, but not a silver bullet, uh, Australia could meet very ambitious targets by 2050. Uh, I changed the slide after Zach, after. Um, uh, Frank talks, uh, without relying on investment in cost-effective abatement in other countries, which is code for emissions trading. Um, <clears throat> and and these, these scenarios only require a small fraction of, of the sequestration potential. Um, they could provide substantial co-benefits in terms of biodiversity and, uh, and habitat loss. The, um, uh, the work, the national outlook work that we're doing uh, <coughs> finds a reduction in species risk of more than 10% in some of these sorts of scenarios. Um, but it brings challenges with, as well as opportunities. Uh, and a, a lot of what's going on under the hood in this modelling is that a lot of our agricultural land, we've got lots of agricultural land, a lot of it is actually pretty marginal. You know, it's profitable, but it's not really profitable. And when we decompose the model, as I said, is CSIRO, and thus very, very good. Um, we can tell from that modelling uh, that more than half the carbon plantings, or half the area that's profitable, more than half of it is five times more profitable for carbon farming than it is under current use. Okay, so these are not marginal changes. That seriously adds to value added in the country when you go to that. <clears throat> for me, this is the big point. All right. I, chided Frank gently, because he's normally right, but not always right. The title of his forum... See? He's trying to shut me down as soon as I criticise him. No, the, the title of the forum here is, you know, our post-2020 targets. And our issue that we should be thinking about is our post-2020 commitments. Okay? Now, to get to the world that this picture is painting in 2050, we have to be well on track before 2030. Okay? Carbon takes a long time to grow. You've got to lock it in for 100 years. There's a whole bunch of other issues that we can talk about over several years. Um, but to get to that world in 2050, you have to start soon. So we need clarity, I've said, well before 2030. Um, I won't try and nail it down a lot more than that. But so the context of the, the next set of commitments we're making are directly relevant to what our potential opportunities are and what opportunities we are ruling out. Um, for 2050. <coughs> and just the last thing I'll note, in 1990, Australia's per capita emissions were five times the world average. They're currently around four times the world average. In anything where Australia's emissions are near zero or negative, clearly 
we are well below the average. Without use of permits, just what we do at home. Thank you very much.